Yep. All right. How about that? It's great. It's amazing. I, like you're yes. looking right at me. It's almost creepy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try not to. I'll, I'll try to look too deeply into your soul. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, um, my man, I'm so excited to chat. Uh, and um, I decided to do this interview series uh, for a couple reasons. One of them is that uh, I have amazing phone calls with people like you. And then I realized, shit, that should have been recorded. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I've been trying to do the same. Have, I want to have something that is as close to a normal conversation as possible that the, the whole world might happen to eavesdrop on. Um, okay. And, uh, and sort of surface that dark data. Uh, and then the second thing is that um, I'm interested in how people process confusion. And um, I've, uh, I've been calling these black box interviews because I've, I've tried to focus on the psychological aspect of like, you know, um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, none of us is an expert. We're all dealing with like the, you know, uh, the chaos. And, um, and somehow like our frameworks don't perfectly match up with reality. And so there's that friction and we, we somehow like uh, go through these dips and valleys of clarity and confusion. And, and the way we, we get back to clarity is always fascinating for me. Um, so I've done about uh, five of these. And last night I did a sixth interview and it was totally different than the others. Um, and the, uh, the, the reason why it was different is instead of asking about the issue directly, I was like, we were talking about a totally separate topic, uh, which, uh, then gave us a backdoor into the same thing. So, um, with you, I want to do a similar thing. I want to like talk about some of the issues of the day and, um, uh, and how you formulate your positions on these issues, um, and how they like relate to you. Uh, and then, um, and then see if that, uh, towards the end of the interview, we can tie that all back into like how you process chaos and confusion. Does that make sense? Fair enough. We'll take an uh, oblique path towards the truth. Yes, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so um, what is a, an issue that's been in the news lately that you've been thinking about? <laughs> so ironically, I've been trying to not think about many issues in the news lately. Um, that's a perfectly rational position. That's what I do most so, of the time. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that being said, obviously, it's easier said than done. So, um, you know, something that I think we might both have quite a bit to say about that I've seen you comment on recently, and I've also fallen into some pretty uh, animosity fueled conversations uh, on other people's part, not on my part, um, on Facebook, uh, kind of revolves around the Me Too issue and the complexity around trying yeah. to understand the difference between making um, moral decisions within legal frameworks to punish people based on actions versus the distinct temptation of many in society to um, protect others with, you know, I, I would say like, you know, an understandable moral intuition, but a lack of clarity with respect to the way that those intuitions would likely unfold into, um, all sorts of moral hazards in reality. If one were to actually give large groups of people the power to uh, even attempt to uh, act that out uh, via any side of any set of codified rules that would have to be created to encapsulate uh, that initial moral intuition that people rightfully feel. So that, that might be an interesting place to start. I'd love it. I was hoping you'd say that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, here, here's where I, I start on this is, is, um, is with the zeitgeist, right? Because there's like what's being said and then what's really being said. Um, and, um, and so uh, the reason why it's, it's hard to talk about this is that it's, um, it's implied. So, so for example, um, there's been a series of sex scandals. Let's just assume all the scandals are legit and all those people are, are basically like total creeps. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, the zeitgeist that so 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 then and let's just assume uh that uh say half of them are being legally punished and half of them are being socially punished um sure. and let's just assume that all this punishment is just okay even with all those assumptions the zeitgeist that it creates is um uh, uh men are scum <laughs> um i i literally like uh, found some journalist who wrote that on her Facebook in like those big banners. 
and I just yeah. shared it. And, and, uh, and it's like, okay, like here's somebody, not me saying men are scum. And, um, and there's certainly, there's certainly a voice in society, um, that is, that is feeling that and saying that, and that's the message. Um, and, um, and there are other messages too, uh, but they're on this other plane above the, the, the issue news political plane that is just like more deeply cultural. Um, and, um, and so I'm going to stop there before I like stake out a position or hear you stake out your position. Like what, it, what would you, how would you, when you take the, you, you know, your fingers to the pulse of culture and try to get a sense for what the zeitgeist is, what's the zeitgeist? And because I haven't defined the term, feel free to define it. What is the zeitgeist of, of this particular movement around this topic? This, this topic, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not even assuming that people who listen to us will know what the word zeitgeist means. Oh, man, it's so, hard to, it's so hard to get out of my own perceptual frame to answer that for society in general. Um, no, because... stay in your perceptual frame. I just want to know what you think. <laughs> well, I mean... So my perspective on this relates to some extent, if not to a large extent, to my thinking on the inherent rationale around polarization or, or the underlying drivers of polarization. And I've been thinking a lot about the idea of polarization from the perspective of a tool for dealing with uh, complexity and certainty and uncertainty. So you know, a cycle in which, for example, upon a complex or chaotic information landscape, to try to create some sort of um, understanding of that landscape, we create a reductive heuristic. And that heuristic, if applied in an overly general and uncaring or um, uh, overly coarse manner, not only helps us identify our allies and isolate our enemies, but it may do so at the expense of being able to have meaningful conversation. It seems like that's the case, right? We create a frame. That frame is a bounding box for our language. Um, and not only does it entrap our own mind, it basically isolates other people's thought patterns outside of that. So we see this, for example, in the past 30 years, we've actually developed completely different uh, lexicons for the Republican and Democratic frame of talking about the same issues. And so what happens then is, you know, the more you live within that frame, the less you can actually communicate, which tends to create more chaos, not less. And therefore you go back to the top of the cycle and try to continuously create another reductive frame on top of that, that only furthers the idea as opposed to, no, only furthers the reductive um, heuristic as opposed to uh, actually exploring the nuance of an issue. And so, you know, then I would overlay that idea of this polarization cycle going on with respect to our communication on top of the evolutionary frame, which is, you know, we have an innate tendency to abstract and generalize patterns. And um, I think the utility of that pattern abstraction has a lot to do with the actual level of complexity it's being applied to. And I don't think we have evolved mechanisms for applying those heuristic patterns to the exponentially increasing complexity of our modern communication landscape. And so I think right now, the zeitgeist, what we actually have, it's coming back to the idea of the zeitgeist, is that there's a misunderstanding of why everybody is actually, well, people don't understand why they're actually behaving the way that they're under, that they are behaving themselves, given the fact that they think they're responding to a, a salient emotional issue and it, they think they're responding to a specific issue and they think that their moral outrage is directed actually towards the moral issue at hand. When I think in reality, there's just a feeling of hopelessness or a feeling of being overwhelmed by this immense amount of information and trying to grasp at truth and therefore cling to any statement, no matter how obviously reductive or potentially destructive it may be. And so bringing it full circle, I think that that's kind of the zeitgeist when applied to many issues and especially the issue of Me Too or the issue of sexual relations dynamic and power between male and females and that being categorized somehow in the uh, three words, men are scum, despite the obvious uh the obvious lack of reality that can be encapsulated by those words matt <laughs> you're mansplaining right now <laughs> well respond i do have a penis <laughs> so to the to the extent that i am a don't person show it to us don't, don't bring it out <laughs> i'm not louis suke 
to the extent that I am a human being uh, with a particular biology, I can't escape that. To the extent that we try to communicate by the explanation of reality, um, I think that's fundamental to our ability to even connect with one another. So I guess guilty as charged. You're a straight, white, privileged male. Respond. <laughs> Respond. Yeah, well, um, so I don't know. I mean, one of my pieces of writing, actually, the first thing that I wrote on Medium, I tried to address a little bit about this. Um, or I tried to kind of just walk down a path of, of thought that tried to tried to demonstrate the real complexity, the real, you know, to the extent that we are human beings interacting with the world, we are in a dance that is extremely complex at every moment. And to the extent we are able to survive over time, that dance compounds into a fractal tapestry of all sorts of variables that impact who we interact with, how we interact with them, how we perceive the signals coming into our brain. And like the landscape of that complexity is, is vast and infinite. And it has very little to do, when you really think about all the variables that are directing behavior, you know, I generally, you know, I think one would be very hard pressed to prove that white male has a lot to do with most of the decisions that I'm making or the things that I'm doing on a daily basis. And to the extent that it does, a lot of that is actually guided top down by people planting information in the seeds of myself or those around me. So an example there would be, I, as a child, remember having all sorts of interactions. You know, I went to a school that was a very, you know, I guess by the standards of diversity, if you're going to define diversity as gender, uh, race, income, blah, 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 I had a, a diverse friend group. And the interesting thing about that diverse friend group as a child is that before all of these structures, the cognitive structures, the definitions of these boundaries that we keep within our language and within our culture before they were imprinted on me. Um, I was able to have much more fluid interactions with these other human beings unbounded or undisturbed by uh, these frames. And the interesting thing is we, and this is the hard part of the conversation because with, with people who don't have a uh, depth of historical knowledge, it's hard to talk about history. Um, and it's also hard to understand if they even come close to understanding the force with which history guides present reality and behavior. Um, but it does so by continuously re-imprinting itself upon us as we move along. Each new brain, you know, it's debatable to what extent brains carry, uh, you know, obviously brains carry a certain amount of evolutionary information. Uh, it's debatable to what extent brains carry cultural information without being imprinted by uh, language and actions around them in their environment. Um, after they've been born. That being said, it's my opinion that a huge amount of the divisions between human beings um, are, are perpetuated by the language we decide to use to discuss issues um, and to define ourselves. Um, that being said, there's a lot of realities that you can't necessarily um, escape just by the use of language. That being said, you can dramatically compound the risk of violence by using the wrong language. And I think that, you know, the language, the problem with language of creating groups that are dramatically oversimplified and then attributing guilt to those groups is almost so obvious that it need not be explained, but it seems to need to be explained every day again and again and again, which is the path to, the path to imposing violence upon large majorities of people who have done nothing wrong begins with first attributing guilt to those whose actions you have no insight into, right? Yeah, but see, they, they would use the same argument against you. They'd say that like certain groups have a tendency to have power or uh, are privileged and certain groups are oppressed. Um, so unless you are a, let's see, what would it be? Unless you are a black, female, transgendered, Islamic woman who's been raped um, uh, <laughs> and who um, has been uh, systematically like marginalized in every possible way from like income to what have you, then like basically you don't understand. And um, well, so I think this, there's an interesting, um, <laughs> I've actually thought of this many times and kind of 
ha- predicated a lot of my thought patterns on this. And I was actually happy to see someone like Peterson come across the same idea and actually start promoting it to his audience, which was, you know, if you're going to talk about categories, it takes very few, uh, you know, it takes a set of very few, a very low number of intersections before you get to the individual. So, you know, when you talk about intersectionality, you start getting in the order of uh, six or seven overlapping categories of marginalization before you literally get down to the level of that you're describing a unique person, right? So like what you just did right there, you know, black, gender, queer, um, person who, you know, lives in the South, who descended from slaves, who um, has been physically abused and was sexually molested under the age of 13. Like there's maybe one person in the world who that describes, right? And so therefore the idea of defending the marginalized effectively boils down to the idea of defending the individual in the margins, right? And so fun. But how come, how come most of their politics don't actually have to do with defending the individual? Well, exactly, right? So that's the thing is it's really not about this is, and this is the, the pivot with respect to um, the, the, the mask of compassion as opposed to the fundamental underlying motivations of resentment. Because if it was actually compassion, they would follow the logical intersectionality to its end conclusion, which is the defense of the individual as the ultimate uh, target of violence in the world uh, with respect to any power structure, the primary of which in our current world are um, those with the most guns, the most able, the most ability and legitimacy of using those within our structures of, of uh, of social interaction, which are generally government forces. And you know, you would then say, okay, if you really wanted to pursue that to its logical conclusion, you would defend the individual against the state. Like that's the logical conclusion. And it's a, it's like, you know, it's a reductive conclusion to some extent, but you know, that's the logical conclusion. Now, if your motivation yeah, yeah, yeah. is actually like a pivot on the oppressor versus the oppressed, and it's driven based on effect, effectively just picking particular classes who you perceive to have more than you and using whatever tactics you might want to use to uh, attack those people and bring them down as opposed to elevating yourself or protecting yourself, then, you know, current behaviors and patterns seem to make more sense in light of that explanation. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. (laughs) Um, So uh, let's just keep moving on instead of trying to summarize or synthesize uh, because I feel like you're, you're dropping, you're dropping some good wisdom. um, But uh, that uh, is worthy of further analysis, but let's just keep, keep expanding the, um, the territory. Uh, So Am I, am I going too divergent or too? I mean, I can no, calibrate no, that. Let's keep, let's keep diverging. I think we should keep diverging. So, um, okay. uh, the so I've I've been thinking about uh, possible solutions to uh, end all sexual scandals. So one possible solution is you create a blanket surveillance state, <laughs> <laughs> and and I actually am in favor of this solution. Um, uh, even I was a, wondering if that was tongue in cheek when I saw you say that on Facebook. I, I'm in favor of the solution. I'm, I'm, I think that, uh, and, uh, that basically the, the single function, the single legitimate function of government is, uh, to be a monopoly on violence, to own all the guns, government equals guns. And, and the only legitimate use of guns is to prevent, uh, other people from using guns. So basically the only legitimate use of violence is to prevent violence. Um, so I'm in favor of getting rid of like, all uh, the, the entire government run judicial system, except for cases involving violence. I'm in favor of like getting rid of all government departments, except those that prevent violence. So, um, so I, I see that as being a consistent position where, uh, you know, like uh, the best way to prevent violence is to create a blanket surveillance state. Um, everyone, everyone and everything is on YouTube. Uh, I could, I could eavesdrop on any government conversation except for like maybe certain like you know, uh, this conversation that involve foreign intelligence or, or defense. Um, I could literally see like Donald Trump and Melania in bed. They can see me in bed. Everyone can see everyone in bed. It's like a total, total um, surveillance state. Um, well, that, would, it's, it's, that, would I mean, prevent, that would prevent any abuse because like you wouldn't be able to get away with it, right? Um, uh, There's and, extreme uh, transparency, right? Is that what that kind of fundamentally boils down to in a way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's some interesting stuff along those lines that I've come across. Um, so somewhat tangentially, there's a, there's a woman, I forget her name right now, 
but she made it, she's been doing a lot of research into the impact of, of transparency on our political systems as, as they stand at the moment and some of the unintended consequences of actually providing more transparency of those systems. Um, and one of those is actually the interesting idea that to some extent for, um, for compromise to actually take effect, sometimes isolation from scrutiny is necessary. The idea being, you know, uh, if, if you actually have a system in which our, you know, this was with, with respect to Congress. So let's say that you have a Republican and Democratic Senator, they want to reach a compromise on, uh, on a particular bill and they and their constituents have an interest in doing so, yet um, particular lobbies may not have an interest in doing so. In a completely transparent system, those with interests who may supersede the interests of the constituents may be able to more effectively apply leverage due to transparency and therefore help the system, uh, help push the system towards um, end results that it was not intended to accomplish for you know, the constituents of those representatives. Now, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, I haven't thought out the implications or the, the parallels or the analogous situation. In the They're sexual. very difficult. They're very difficult to think out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, um, it's interesting. The idea, like, what would the fun, what would, so for, for example, from where I come from, I think a lot about all of these things from a kind of systems dynamics perspective, uh, you know, complexity theory perspective. Um, in which you know certain low-level changes, uh, you know, kind of fundamentally shift behaviors, and then that bubbles upward or emerges upward, and not until it reaches a very high level of emergence do we start actually perceiving it with our conscious mind. But by that time, it's very difficult to do anything about. So I would wonder, to the extent that we allow complete transparency into the sexual relations of human beings at all times across all boundaries. Uh, to what extent do we fundamentally change the nature of sexual relationships? And to what extent does that fundamentally change the structure of society? Exactly. And to what extent does that potentially yeah. dis dissolve the entire evolution? Because I mean, that's fucking with evolution itself. And that like, you know, that's sex right. is uh -huh. and when you do that, you run a very real risk, very real risk of dissolving the fundamental technological means or biological means by which we've consolidated effectively every pattern we have in society today. So it's not, you know, it's playing with fire yeah. of, the most, so, of, of the highest so order. It is playing with fire, but you're always playing with fire. Mm. Um, so, yeah. so I think like everything is always evolving. The only thing that is constant is change. So um, <laughs> like I, 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 think I, I in the essay I just wrote actually, I haven't published it yet, but I'm always interested in the essays you write. <laughs> you the, whole last, the whole last section it deals with precisely that actually, but. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm waiting for approval via one of the, the media publications before I publish it. But got it. Um, so uh, when so I, I like to think about issues in terms of very futuristic technologies because it tends to give you a different lens into the issue. So we're still talking about sex scandal, but um, you know, if you start start introducing a concept like brain machine interfaces, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then and then uploading it constantly like a surveillance state. Like if every single thought I had uh, could be transcribed by technology and then yeah. uploaded to the internet. So like my literal thought life was public. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would mean every single girl I see that I think, oh man, she's cute. Um, uh, or like nice ass. Like literally any thought um, would be known to, to her in real time and to everyone in real time. Um, I think that would be assuming, assuming right. that we also have the fundamental bandwidth to process that level of information. Yeah, which, and there's there's certainly the bandwidth issue. Um, and and which so we, let's just right? I mean, let's let me tell you know, what assumptions are we talking about? Like, if we're talking about fundamentally changing the brain to the extent that we do, then it's like okay, it's kind of like we're in the philosophical territory of what's it like to be a bat. I mean, I don't know what it's like to be the type of person that can process all the world's information. And no, no, no. So, so I'm not talking about being able to process all the world's information. I think that like law enforcement agencies would have this big data problem and, and I think they would turn into big data agencies. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, let's just assume that the technology existed that, you know, we were able to radar for any thoughts about us in our, in our vicinity um, or, or, or just be aware of thoughts specifically about us, like a notification, like an at handle. Like anytime I think at Matt Burkowski, you get a notification, Francis thought about you and he had this thought, okay? Um, uh, 
But it's like past what threshold, right? This all becomes a, another, again, this becomes a question of selective attention. It, it becomes a question of to what extent, and this actually relates to some extent to the conversation on violence and arguments that you were having on Facebook with somebody with respect to well, what is the boundary of violence, right? And then it becomes the same thing. It's like, well, what is the boundary of attention? Where, where, what, is the, what is the separation between you know, a thought about an environment with someone in it and a thought about the person? or a thought about sex in general, uh, or a thought about violence in general, or a thought about violence or sex in general with intent to abuse with respect to the person versus respect to the person in an environment, with respect to the person in an environment in an outfit, with respect to, I mean, I don't know, where does that stop? It's, yeah. It seems very difficult yeah. to even draw that line or even conceptualize a line. <clears throat> yep, you're right. All those, all those problems are real, um, uh, but uh, what, let's 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 see if we can like use the hypothetical in some way so um oh one second one second one second one yeah. second my uh sometimes when my phone rings it overrides my audio so i couldn't hear you got it um so what would that say do what do i mean it's all speculation right but like what do you think uh that would do to shift the the debate and the zeitgeist because one thing it seems to me they would do is you know peterson talks about this a lot like um inside all of us there is a hitler there's a stalin there's a sex offender there's like all the bad guys like are, live inside of me like mm -hmm. uh just we the problem you know uh, um and sure. and um and i think that uh you know it, it like institutions like marriage institutions like like the the company like the firm you know there would be an interesting breakdown if there was radical transparency but then also i think like an interesting reassembly like they you know like i don't think society would just end yeah. i think it would like come yeah, back together and well, be, like, I mean, that's, that's the path of the borg the borg uh you gotta yeah. you gotta uh, explain that literally, to me. I mean, I, that, that, that's literally that is literally the path to and you know i'm not i'm not making a value judgment about whether this is a good or a bad thing but that is most certainly the path to um, you know, the dissolution of the ego and the self in the collective identity and intelligence. And to some but extent- But does it necessarily mean the dissolution of the ego? Um, I, I think it is possible to have an individual even in a radically transparent environment. I don't think so, because I think what you're doing by creating that level of radical transparency is by definition dissolving all of the boundaries by which you would define the individual or the ego. Right. If you, if, if all right, of I would still, I would still have, I would still have my thoughts. I would, I would still have my thoughts. They'd just be, they'd just be on platform. Right. I mean, um, would you, to the, to the extent that they're yours, aren't they only yours because they can be separated from others? Uh, they, they are separated by the attribution to me. I can still control the agent uh, of, of my brain. Um, so I still have agency over what I think next and what I think um, to some degree. Um, the the difference is just that you, Okay. Well, the question is, is that true today? Well, so exactly. Right. And I think that like, I would already be in the camp where it's, it's already difficult to understand to what extent one's thoughts are one's own, except for the fact that we have the delimiting capacity to do so by the fact that they resist, they exist within one's own, within another's head or within one's own head. And they are inaccessible um, to a large extent without that person at least presumably choosing to express them via behavior, whether that's a physical act or words or, or whatever, their actions in the universe. Um, now, to the extent that you break down that barrier, to the extent that you break down the barrier of individualism defined as that person's behaviors in the world, as opposed to other people's behaviors in the world, by taking all of what is in their head and projecting it and connecting it uh, wholesale, with that of the rest of the network, I think you've taken a very large step towards dissolving what any boundary that we may be able to draw around the individual. So I'm going to, I'm going to anchor this with a story. Um, so in, okay. in a book called all things shining, um, which uh, I'm sure progressives pro progressives would love this book on its face because it's, um, it's written by, um, you know, a Berkeley professor, and it's um, it, it reads like a TEDx, a TED talk, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it contains some dangerous ideas. So um, it's it's all things shining is written by Hubert Dreyfus um, and Sean Dorrance Kelly, and um, it's about Homeric virtue. 
uh, as, as an answer for the, the cultural problem of our time, which they, they term as like, you know, unreconstructed nihilism, um, meaninglessness. Sure. And, um, and so uh, they tell a story from Homer of Helen, Helen of Troy. Um, Helen is now, you know, the Trojan War has ended um, and she is back with Menelaus, who she cheated upon with Paris, mm -hmm. um, which precipitated this giant conflict sure. and so many people died, right? Um, yep. So she, 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 her husband has like literally fought like yep. a world war um, to get her back. The aftermath. That has she got her back, she right? Herself created in some ways. Right, yeah, she, she herself created, right. And, and the, the, the setting is a dinner table. By way of her mere, mere existence, not necessarily by her actions, which is also an interesting distinction. Yeah, but there is an action, right? So, um, so her existence is, so, she's so beautiful, but she acted, right? She cheated with Paris. She cheated on Menelaus in Paris. So we, even, you know, to your point on language, I'm using the word cheated, right? Which is, um, which is not the word that Homer uses. Um, and, uh, and so Telemachus, Odysseus' son, is visiting, and he's the visiting guest. And Menelaus says, Helen, tell him the story. And Helen tells him the whole story of how, like, Paris came as a guest from Troy to the Achaeans, and he was shining, and like, I felt such lust, uncontrollable lust, I had to be with him. As soon as I saw him, I had to be with him. And so we had this passionate, fiery romance, and we, we had to like escape together to be together, and so we escaped to Troy, and then that created this, but she tells the whole story. And then at the end of the story, at the end of, the, at the end of story time, uh, Menelaus and everyone claps, and they recognize her as shining among women. Um, and as like an embodiment of virtue. So this is a very strange dinner conversation. Um, and if you don't understand the Homeric uh, sensibility around morality, um, the sensibility being that uh, the gods come down and uh, sometimes it's Hera, sometimes it's Aphrodite, sometimes it's Ares, sometimes it's Athena. And they, they, they move us, they inspire us to, to enter this window of opportunity and do this thing. They give us a clear guidance and we can either respond and do it or resist. And um, uh, you know, ours is not to question why, ours is but to do or die. You know, like Helen was, was shining among women because when Aphrodite came and said, you know, sleep with this man, indulge in this lust, um, she responded, and she she was Aphrodite. Like she channeled that spirit, and and in the same way, the Greeks uh, in in going to war with the Trojans were following the spirit of Ares of like defend your honor, get your woman. Um, so everyone is just conceived of as like actors in a play, um, doing their role, and morality is like is is being sensitive to that. Whereas our our sort of like even with postmodern um, relatively like uh, nihilistic, um, progressive neo-Marxists. <laughs> um, uh, the the uh, conception of morality is still in some way very Judeo-Christian in that it's like there is right, there is wrong. Um, like, uh, you know, uh, these people are wrong. So if we, if you go with this, the, the danger with this Homeric idea is that it sort of absolves individuals of uh, normal what we would call normal moral responsibility because it says you know the sex offender could say like i'm sorry like uh, aphrodite made me do it um and um and so i find this this whole, which is which the boy i mean the connection there to the psychoanalytic frame is you know that is much like saying the voice in my head made me do it right um so, I mean, I, I want to let you finish before I, I would like to. No, I'm, I'm basically that. done. Like, please respond because there's a lot here to respond to. Yeah. And so one interesting element about that parallel, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the idea and this is this, you know, to some extent, the Jungian idea of, you know, the gods outside of us being almost, uh, you know, we, our consciousness is this vessel through which our entire evolutionary history and our past and everything that's been codified within us and resides within our brain gets literally projected out onto the world and onto the sky and you know this idea that these archetypes and these ideas that we discuss when it comes to i you know gods that embody certain psychological characteristics driven by and parameterized by our behavior our evolution our past our, our mating structures um that's a it's, it's a fairly powerful frame to think of one's own psyche as this you know kind of panoply or this, this pantheon of internal psychological gods that are competing for one's attention 
that are competing for the, you know, actually in my last essay, I compared this to, you know, internal gods competing for the reins. And if one possesses the reins, one can control one's actions, right? And it's never necessarily the case that one of these gods gets to hold the reins for all of time. Um, and they oftentimes compete at different levels of granularity all, all the time, right? It's like, to some extent, you might be in the throes of passion and still get hungry, right? Um, and, and therefore, despite the fact that you may be wanting sex, you know, uh, even within that frame, and even if you go back to it afterwards in that moment, you also need food or sustenance. Um, and it's like, there's this idea, I think the, the element where this connects to morality is the notion that to ascribe and also where this connects to Christianity is that Christians seem to take that idea of all of these voices in one's head and then say, there is a vessel in which all of them exist and that vessel is you and it is the moral responsibility of the vessel, the Christ figure to encapsulate all of these, you know, all of these different um, potential directions um, that one might go and direct those towards um, the path of good, the path of God um, and, and, you know, away from the path of the devil and which, you know, depends on how you map it, you know, can either map, you know, I kind of like thinking of those as order and chaos, right? Like the path via which we can persist our pattern or the path via which everything will fall apart and deteriorate into entropy. Um, and I think that to the extent that we are able to place our morality on one singular fractionated part of ourselves, we lose perspective on the whole because we're no longer looking at ourselves in our own totality or respecting all of the other internal gods or all of our other internal needs to the extent that we say that one God can hold the reins to the exclusion of all others and therefore hold the responsibility. We also deny the fact that we are a multiplicity. And if we deny the fact that we are the multiplicity, we're going to ignore the needs of those other gods. And to the extent that we ignore the needs of those other gods, we risk dissolution as a self and as a society. I followed all of that. But let's just assume somebody didn't follow all of that. And they're listening to us talk and they're like, what the fuck are these guys talking about? <laughs> like we started, we started talking about sex scandals and like, they're still, let's suppose they're the kind of person who's so reductionist that they're like, look, it's just wrong. And like, you know, like it should just be punished. And like, it's just a very clear cut case. And like, you know, we just need to punish these people. And it's like, you know, and then, and then like, why the fuck are these guys talking about all this stuff? Like, um, you know, can you bring all the, the things that we've talked about and your, your point of view down to that, that level and, and like, tell them what it means? Like, what are you really saying? <laughs> bring it down, down to the level of, uh, you know, whether or not to physically punish. You know, um, how about we role play? Um, I'm going to be a progressive uh, activist, um, a feminist progressive activist. And I'm going to say like, um, you know, Matthew, like, uh, how dare you say anything about this topic other than to condemn and to say that uh, we need to dismantle the patriarchy. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I, my general position on these on these issues with respect to a statement like that is that we've created structures over a long period of time that allow us to balance the idea of punishing those um, that seem obviously um, in error, that seem to be obvious um, purveyors of evil in our world. But we've delegated the responsibility for that punishment out, you know, to systems outside of the individual. And it seems as if there's a history with a rationale that goes along with that. That's a very good history. You know, there's a deep history. There are many reasons why we've decided to not just let anybody slice the throat of another human being if they feel offended or if they feel personally that someone else has committed great evil in their world. Like even if someone raped my girlfriend, whom I love, despite the fact that I want to murder that person and I would want to kill them instantly, should I do that? What are the consequences of doing that? how do those consequences ripple outwards from me and across time? And I think that it's very obvious if one looks at the history of humanity, that we have a very strong tendency towards feuds, that we have a very strong tendency towards misunderstandings escalating into, you know, generations worth of bloodshed, spilling 
thousands or millions of people's worth of blood who didn't deserve it. And I would ask that person to weigh their own personal confidence that they are so capable of discerning right from wrong and good from evil against the other side of the scale, which is the possibility that their overconfidence can trigger the massive bloodshed and death, you know, the, the, the effectively, you know, a massively larger amount of suffering in the world. And I think those cascades are very real. But, but don't you think there should be a law that just makes any kind of um, uh, sexual advance by any male in, in a work environment, in a position of power, um, uh, illegal? And don't you think we should like legally force all companies to have at least 50% women? And um, uh, don't you think that... Um, uh, all sexual sex sex offenders should be, or all all, all people who've made sexual advances, um, inappropriate sexual advances, should be um, put in jail. Yeah, well, this is where we come to the crux of the issue, which is, to what extent do we actually acknowledge evolution and biology as a driver of human behavior? Because to the extent that one actually understands who we are as a species and what we do as a species and and why we behave the way we behave as a species. Um, it becomes very difficult to say what is or what is not a sexual advance. Is the very act of a male trying to earn money and power and status a sexual advance, given the role that it plays within sexual signaling? To the extent that that guides behavior in any degree, is that unjustifiable in society? And that's where we're, you know, these are the questions we're asking when we're talking about things like toxic masculinity, because the, those who say toxic ma- you know, masculinity, to the extent that it is masculine, is toxic are those who would say that all behavior that flows or is derived from evolutionary tendencies of males is behavior that we should purge from society. And to the extent that you go down that path, it becomes very difficult to understand any behavior of a male in an office place that couldn't be defined as such. And to that extent, to that extent, to the degree that you want to impose those rules, you're basically just going to separate. You're going to draw a wall between men and women and say, there's just no interaction, and we're going to have two societies. There's going to be a male society and a female society. So you end up with you end up with Islam. <laughs> yes. Like extreme feminists want that, um, in a way. Well, that's, that's uh, why they get along. I mean, that's in some ways that's why they get along. I, or I mean, there are many. There's it's extremely complicated. You know, the the kind of incentive alignment between, you know, radical progressives and uh, <laughs> radical conservatives in in the Islamic world. Part of which is just because they hate the same power structures they hate the same yeah and there's there's actually a similar <laughs> weird alliance between uh conservative christians and uh an aggressive aggressive progressives um progressive feminists um because because here's the here's the alignment i see there which is that um the conservative christians want to go back to like a puritanism right so they look at rap uh they look at uh porn they look at um uh, every TV show that Hollywood produces or movie that has like, uh, you know, describes uh, profligacy um, and, 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 and they, um, they say bad, you know, bad Wolf of Wall Street, bad Mad Men, bad rap, you know, bad, bad, yeah. bad, 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 bad. Um, and the, the, the funny thing about this is that like progressive feminists have been the other side of that conversation for like decades. They've been like, no, it's expression. No, these are like, you know, rap is coming from an oppressed people group. And, um, and like, um, uh, no, like, uh, you know, sex, sex should be free and open. But then like on this issue, they're actually like in total agreement because the conservative Christian wants to punish anyone who's not having sex inside of a monogamous relationship and isn't Mike Pence. Um, and, uh, and then the, the like uh, feminist wants to punish men. <laughs> so, uh, so what well, do you, I mean, what do you make of these? Like, weird, weird just, yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, it's easier to start understanding the alliances to some extent when you consider the fact that both of those sides, you know, when you come to either, you know, to the extent that you go to the radical right or radical progressivism, what they begin to share from just a pattern matching perspective is that they both want very black and white interpretations of reality. They wanna draw very strong 
uh, categorical boundaries around things and think in very and speak in very and act in the very absolutist terms. And to the extent that they do that, you know, their instincts are totalitarian. And to the extent that reality is complex, it will lie outside those distinct boundaries and will need to be suppressed or attacked. And so, you know, that's, that's in my mind, you know, that seems to be, you know, that seems to be the path down which, you know, when, whenever anyone wants to take a particular ideology or category system and apply it uh, in toto to encapsulate all of reality, you know, we've seen via mathematicians, via, you know, people like Godel that it's just fundamentally impossible to do that. Reality will fight back. Reality will fundamentally inject paradox and complexity into any attempt one tries to do, you know, to, to reduce its, you know, its fundamental complexity to simplicity. Yes. And yes, and, yes. There's, go ahead. Yeah. And I don't, I don't mean to get too esoteric here, but it's just, I think that to the extent that one thinks that one is capable of, of actually shoving the square peg of reality into the round hole of ideology, you know, the edges that will get shaved off are human lives. <laughs> um, so let's talk about legislating morality because it seems that, um, again, like this isn't, this is, this is one of those things that's rarely openly expressed, although it is openly expressed if you like know where to find it. Um, but it's sort of underlying the, the, the media um, narrative which is that, you know, the media narrative is like, look at this sex scandal, look at this sex scandal, look at this sex scandal, outrage, outrage, outrage. And so they don't actually say men are scum. They don't actually say, uh, you know, we should be legislating this morality, but, but it, it's almost like they're building a case, building an argument. And it's like, it could be like in 10 years, you know, it's like, hey, we should legislate morality. Um, and the, um, here's the, Here's the problem with it um, that I, I see, and I am going to get to a question, but I need to sort of like uh, understand my own thoughts. So let's, let's assume there are two companies. Uh, and uh, company A has uh, couple A. And couple A is um, a, a, an assistant and a CEO who end up in a sexual relationship. Um, and they both love it. And they're both, let's just say they're both cheating on their, their, their significant others, okay? But it's consensual and it's like the best experience they've ever had in their lives, okay? Um, and let's just suppose they end up having like spiritual realizations and like, uh, and, and, and end up like becoming better people as a result of it, right? <laughs> uh, or at least in their own mind, they become better people yeah. as a result. They're like in, 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 their local, in their local reality, all is aligned, all is yeah. spiritually wonderful, all is for the good. In the greater yeah, context yeah. that we define as society, that may not be the case. That's kind of what that situation yeah. represents, right? Yeah, yeah. And let's say in this reality, like um, uh, the woman, like like the assistant, um, uh, let's just say that she, um, uh, one you of the things that turns that. her on, tur turns 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 her around, or turns her on most about the situation is that it's her boss. Mm -hmm. And then like she wants to be dominated, he wants to dominate, and they like go live out that fantasy, All right? company b well it's like the consensual um, they have like every day they have like consensual rape play or something like that and they're both you know doing yeah. this and they're both psychologically potentially destroying one another yet they're doing it within the boundaries of, of social dictum moral dictum yeah right right okay um let's take company b uh, uh everything is the same um except it's a woman who's the ceo uh and the man who's who's the assistant and um, the uh, uh, it's all uh, it's all consensual uh, until uh, they break up. The man quits and he like files a lawsuit. Um, as soon as you start legislating morality, at, like where where like say say the say the say the more morality that was legislated was um, uh, power like economic power structures or like economic power relationships between an employer and an employee or a manager and a, um, uh, a report um, uh, cannot be used as sexual leverage. Um, and all of a sudden you end up in court and it's like, I don't know, it's like this, the, same, the same exact situation uh, in one situation like you know, there's no, there's no lawsuit, so it doesn't go to court. In the other situation, there is a lawsuit, it does go to court. In both situations, the same thing happened. In one situation, somebody ends up guilty. Um, and, um, and so this is where, to, in my mind, uh, the only clear morality is violence. Um, 
and and pr preventing uh, preventing violence. Um, and all the edge cases around violence, like, um, end up needing to end up involving like um, the assertion that uh, somebody was so weak or so victimized that they couldn't speak out and they couldn't say no and they couldn't exit, mm -hmm. even though it was nonviolent. So mm -hmm. um, uh, in a lot of the conversations I've been having, it's like, well, no, like you don't understand what it's like, all the negative repercussions, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, uh, and, and this is why like government needs to protect them. Um, and so, yeah comments we're going to end there hmm. so you know i have sympathy for those who you know who want their internal reality to be recognized as a reality um, i mean i think to some extent i agree with the fact that much of our philosophical history uh, and especially the scientific history has to a large extent um, underestimated the reality of subjective perception, the, the reality of, you know, the degree to which, uh, I guess I would put the, the Heideggerian, uh, the degree to which the Heideggerian problem is, is a fundamental problem in, in our world, the degree to which, you know, we actually contribute to the You're production. You're going to explain that to other people. Heideggerian sure, problem? Sure. What's the Heideggerian sure. problem? So, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, well, I mean, just the, the extent to which the extent to which we make the assumption that there's an objective reality apart from ourselves and we're just passively observing it, as opposed to the fact that things outside of ourselves are half what they are and half kind of like mirrors that just reflect what we are back at us. Um, and that we're constantly moving through this world of, of partial truth and partial reflection in a way, right? If that, does that make sense? Do you think that that's graspable? generally or is that a is that a bad metaphor uh yeah why don't you try explain it one more time mm -hmm. and then and then let's move on okay well huh, phenomenology in a sentence is a difficult one that's a high bar um you know i think it's just the idea that in general um science and philosophy has largely tended towards pushing humanity uh, into systems that prioritize um, shared consensual objective reality outside of the individual, outside of what happens inside the mind. And to the extent that they do that, they do oppress the subjective reality. They sacrifice the subjective legitimacy of experience to the convenience and functionality of consensus reality. Now, that being said, if you want to start making trade-offs, you, you can't begin by saying consensus reality is oppressive and therefore needs to be destroyed in total. You have to actually understand what we're getting for that sacrifice. And despite the fact that I have a huge amount of sympathy for those who, who want to inject more of a subjective frame into the objective systems of management, such as the legal system, um, there are massive costs of doing so given just how difficult it is to get a grasp on subjective reality or, you know, this is where we began our conversation. Once you start injecting those unique parts of ourselves that cannot be defined, you very quickly end up in a position where you need access to every piece of data. Right. And this is where you end up with the argument, well, we should just have complete transparency for absolutely everything, including the internal state. Right. So this is kind of the this is the this is the argument for why it is extremely not why it is not only useful to have a prioritization on objective consensus reality, but why our very individuality and our ability to have a subjective self may depend on keeping the integrity of the objective external reality and systems that maintain it. That was so good, and I'm so glad I asked you to, to do it one more time because um, it, I think it came together powerfully. Um, I'm gonna put my own like uh, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna I'm gonna play in the world you just made. So um, one of the ways I conceive of phenomenology is the idea of like a player in game space, right? Mm -hmm. So like you design some world, and then you drop the player in, and yep. so consensus consensus objective reality might be like um, some like city that exists in this this video game. 
and like you drop the player into game space and they can like go into the city and they see all the buildings and the walls and, and like the marketplace and whatever. Uh, and they can look around and like see all this, this like this reality that is shared with everyone in the city uh, and the rules of the city exist. But then what happens if they choose to leave the city? Mm -hmm. um, they go out and then all of a sudden like that, all that whole structure is gone and then they're in the wilderness again. And then they, they always have the choice to like make a new city uh, or keep exploring or go somewhere else. Um, and Well, you want to play with this in a way that's even more interesting to, to today's uh, current technology landscape? Please, please. All right, so let's consider the exact same idea, but from the perspective of instead of exiting the same consensus reality video game, instead we're operating with AR. And what we're instead doing is overlaying our own maps of reality onto the same physical spaces. And then you have to ask yourself the question, to what extent or how extremely can you do that before all consensus reality or the ability to even uh, talk about the same spaces in ways that are um, constructive or meaningful disappear? To what extent does Francis's AR world and Matt's AR world of the same, uh, of the same shopping mall to what extent do they have to diverge before we can no longer even walk through it together as friends having a meaningful conversation? <laughs> yeah, and, and is that really a problem? In a, in a way, something that is beautiful about um, life is that uh, we don't uh, see everything eye to eye. Um, so mm -hmm. you, you and I um, can have gains from trade. Because if we, we agreed on everything, there would be no benefit really to talking. Um, yep. And so... Um, so yeah, the, um, where, where was I going with this? Um, okay, so, so let's, let's assume that what we've done is, uh, let's assume we could take a man from, from uh, 6,000 years ago. <laughs> okay. And like bring him into 2017. It's like the Pauli uh, Shore principle, right? Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, is it, do you want to explain you, it? Th th there's a, was it Encino Man or something like that? Where like they had like a caveman that came back to like 90s LA or some silly. <laughs> I, I forget exactly, but sorry, continue. Just it's basically that, right? Yeah. Um, so so in, when I connect with the most masculine and basic parts of me, um, mm. what I discover there is what I call the barbarian, right? And the barbarian has like some some like things that are hardwired into him. Uh, mm -hmm. and one of them is kill all men, fuck all women. It's just like <laughs> dominate, like be the alpha, create a fucking pyramid, like make uh, everyone is either like, you know, your servant or like the servant of your servant and like, or, or in game, like in game huh? theoretical terms in game theoretical terms, it's defect against all men, cooperate with all women. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. Exactly. Right. And like, um, the only way to cooperate with men is if they, if they like, uh, you dominate them and they're, they're imposing your will. And, um, and I think that I would guess, cause I don't know. Um, but if, you know, the alpha female, I think is basically has the instruction of like dominate the alpha male. Um, and uh, if you can dominate the alpha male, you're optimizing for your power position because you're, you're dominating everyone else by extension. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and this is why I actually think women around the world. Um, so, yeah. so anyways, um, well, I mean, nature, nature would agree. All of evolutionary biology seems to point in that direction. Yeah, to women not, actually not, having not, not, just, not just for men, for all species. Like, for basically yeah. all species, women kind of run the show, and, and their preferences determine, to a large extent, the, like their mating preferences across many species determine uh, almost the entirety of the life, the morphology, the shape, the behavior, everything of the men. So yeah. it's like... And I, I think the balance of power between genders shifts in times of war and times of peace. Like in times of mm -hmm. war, the, the male agenda tends to dominate. Um, uh, times of peace, the female agenda. So, um, so anyways, I'm going to go back to this, this idea of like, you know, let's say we're designing the system of society. We're looking at the system, right? We've dropped in this, this, this man from 6,000 years ago. Um, and he is rebelling against the system because he's walking around the streets of LA and his his natural instincts are driving him towards breaking effectively the law <laughs> um and uh um, going after all the women in midi skirts is what you're saying right wait say, say that again because he's like going after all the women in mini skirts 
Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and trying to club every man who comes up against them or, you know, hitting police officers who try to stop him. Exactly. You're right. Um, and, and to me, there's a purity in the barbarian because the barbarian is staying true to his own nature. Right. Um, and, and that, uh, you could say that's selfish, uh, or whatever, but you can't deny that like, uh, uh, the, 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 almost the beauty of that purity, because it's like, uh, it's like the, the purity of a bird in a way. It's like, you know, what does a bird do? A bird flies and a bird eats worms and a bird like has nests and like that's what a bird does. And so like, it's just following its, its instincts. Um, and, and so uh, I think, I what you're saying is- Conceptual slippage. What's the conceptual so, slippage? So, well, um, so like in terms of the language that we were using and, and the situation that we were outlining relative to where our conversation went. So we were talking about the, the actual concrete individual of the caveman being brought into our reality, right? Uh, and you're talking about simultaneously the idea of the caveman's you know, behavior to some extent being driven by the conceptual abstraction of the barbarian, right? Which you're saying is the abstraction of uh, cooperate with all women and defect against all men or have sex with all women and kill all men. Um, and even though that might be an essential characteristic or abstraction, I would say that that still doesn't, you know, if you were to even look at the man from 6,000 years ago, even in his own context, it was more complex than that in his social reality. That's right. Right. That's right. So, but then we, but then we were more talk, uh, so then we were starting to talk, I think I, we we're just, in my mind, it seemed like we were starting to talk about the barbarian in 2017 or the, the caveman in 2017 as pure barbarian concept, as opposed to as part barbarian concept and part human who can also respond to a new environment. Well, right. So, so that's, you're, you're leading the punchline here, which is that, uh, and maybe 6,000 years ago isn't, isn't far back because I, I hate chronological snobbery. Uh, and, um, and you know, when you say barbarian, years, I think what you mean is like actual. Six thousand years ago, there was there was civilization. So maybe we should go all the way back, like I don't know, twenty thousand years ago or something. Um, sure. But uh, the, the the point is that at some point you'd have to sit the sit the caveman down, sit the barbarian down, and like explain to him concept after concept after concept, and get some sort of moral buy-in. And you, there would be points at which he'd be like, "But why?" Or like, or like. Why, or like, okay, I under I understand, but like, why should I agree to this? And the answer is, the answer comes down to guns. The answer comes down to like, well, if you don't agree to this or don't play by these rules, we're going to put you in jail and kill you. And so, um, uh, or isolation, or just like you know, exclusion, you, punish, exclude, exclude you, or whatever, whatever the punishment is. I think realistically in our society, it's jail. So, um, so the it comes down to like a basic choice between like do I, do I agree to change my nature and become a literally a different person operating by different value sets? Uh, do I agree to that? Or do I stay true to my nature and then get like evolutionarily wiped out? Like, you know, like basically die, get killed. Um, and, and, um, uh, like that does, the way this relates to the whole Heideggerian principle, uh, <laughs> is is in my mind like that um the we want to minimize the amount of of imposition of values that we have to make because we never know when somebody's going to invent a new value and we never want to assume that we've reached the final truth so the the like minimal val the minimal moral footprint of government is just preventing physical violence and that's like a very simple conversation to have with the barbarian where it's like you know what just don't be violent. Do whatever the fuck you want. And, and everything else is just a question of who you can get to agree with your values. That makes sense? Yeah. And, I mean, and does, I, is, that a good, is that a good interpretation of like why this principle is important, the subjectivity principle is important? I mean, I think there's a couple, I think there's a couple lines of thought to go down there. I'm trying to trying to work out which one's gonna be most productive. But, you know, let's just start with the idea in terms of, you know, let's, let's start breaking down the notion that we've reduced this to the idea that government or these structures exist 
um, purely to enforce the only justifiable endpoint of their purpose, which is, uh, you know, jailing those who defect against current moral standards using force acted with guns, or acted out with guns. Um, I think this brings us back to the idea to some extent of that is the morality of the obje objective. That is the morality of, you know, in the objective rational world, that is the only justifiable morality because those are the only, those are the only available choices in the government's option, uh, option in, in, in its uh, portfolio of options. Um, that being said, I tend to look at things from like an emergent perspective. So, you know, to some extent, the government is an emergent abstraction based upon a complex group of human beings interacting with one another in innumerable ways. And one of the ways in which human beings interact with one another before it escalates to the system of law, before it gets tossed over the wall into the territory of, of objective guns and imprisonment is via you know, social norms, right? Social norms, behaviors, um, marginalization of people who are not acting in accordance with uh, whatever those dictums may be, right? Which, you know, this is the territory, I think the, you know, those in the social justice, um, <laughs> I'll try not to be too harsh here. Um, you know, those, those who advocate for the, the social justice worldview seem to focus on, on this part of reality and say that it is in these layers of society in these layers of norms and these layers of behavior in these layers of soft power, you know, the, the actual uh, patterns are so corrupt that it is justified to use force to change them, right? Which is interesting, right? Because they're saying that the layer, in, in the layer beneath the rational layer at which we would be able to logically use force, they get to use force to change the behaviors of society that should remain outside of the purviews of force, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Is that too abstract? It's like, instead of, are you still with me? I think you may be. Um, I, uh, the, the, the internet connection, the internet connection here died and then I had to use my hotspot. I think, uh, this coffee shop had some sort of bandwidth limit or something. Uh -oh. Um, so, uh, so you were about to, you, you were on the line of like social justice. I'm going to choose my word carefully here. <laughs> Damn. I actually, I think I, I think I did a pretty decent job of explaining what I was trying to explain. Um, all right, let me try it again. Hopefully I can do an even better job. Um, Okay, so what I was trying to get at is that there's this layer of, you know, if you kind of look at society as an emergent phenomenon, I think it looks a little bit different than if you look at it from the rational lens of a objective or reducible phenomenon. And so, but they both have to cooperate with one another because they're both realities to some extent, because like we were talking about, this shared objective consensus reality has to play by the rules of reductive objective reality. And so, the laws and the frameworks by which we define those who get subjected to physical force or violence, those are in this layer that is codified um, formally and rationally and is, is subject to uh, the use of force. But then outside of that, you know, in, in the part of society that is responsible for enforcing the soft power, which is responsible for enforcing, you know, norms of behavior, uh, before throwing people over the wall into the realm of, of government punishment or the legal system. Um, we have many different ways of, of navigating that space as well. And I think the people who tend towards social justice are those that focus 
um, to the exclusion of the utility of the rational space of laws and structures and their purpose, they focus on the soft power structures and how those are imbalanced from their perspective. Um, now, the thing is, it's not necessarily a problem for them to identify that there are imbalances or that imbalance ex exists within that space of soft power, but the, the kind of kung fu move that comes into play here is that they try to then say, outside of the scope of rationally justifiable force, we now get to use force and violence to change the structures of soft power as we see fit outside the scope of the rationally justifiable and socially agreed upon structures of, uh, you know, of, of government authority and force, right? And that's, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, you can't have it both ways. If you're going to try to change social norms, you, you know, in a society that has agreed upon a boundary for the use of force, you have to do so outside the use of force, right? And that seems to be the rule by which they refuse to play. Yeah, they hate, they hate violence, but they use violence. Um, and um, the, yeah, you, you might think of like two social justice warriors. Um, one of them, uh, you know, they both have the same exact moral agenda, but one of them is trying to enact a law and the other one is trying to convince society to just change its behavior by free will. They're, they're like a, a cultural influencer, a value influencer. And like, it seems that this kind doesn't exist, that the only thing is really ultimately about the law, um, which is, which is uh, forcing people to do things. Um, and, and I think that like, uh, well, this is, have you read like Marcuse or like the, the Frankfurt school? No. Uh, who's that? No. Herbert Marcuse. He's like the person responsible for the language around the great refusal. He wrote one dimensional man. Um, Frankfurt school was a school of postmodern philosophers that, um, you know, emigrated from, uh, post world war two or they flee Germany before world war two, actually before, um, before, uh, they were no longer able to, um, and they came to the United States. They embedded themselves in the intellectual um, kind of milieu of of the time in the U.S. and uh, really advanced most of what became modern critical theory. And the interesting thing about Marcuse is that he, you know, his idea of this great refusal it's it's too complex to really fully get into, but you know, his idea of the only way that you could change capitalism without being co-opted co by the mechanisms of capitalism is to slowly use um, art and culture, like in the same way that you're talking about, there's, there's the law and then there's this other group, which is, you know, you're saying don't exist, but his whole focus was on that group and the use of the tools of that group to change the collective consciousness subtly over time so that um, the structures of the, you know, those in the, in, on the other group who are trying to change the macro structure of society via law and physical structure um, have an easier time of doing so. And, you know, he saw this as this long-term transformation and he saw that, that relationship of the cultural and the legal over a long period of time being the only way to affect his anti-capitalist, relatively Marxist agenda without um, excessive use of violence, force, or uh, irreconcilable destabilization. Uh, His or plan just, is working. One could make the case that, I mean, I it's think that, yeah, they're, you know. Amazingly well. Yeah. I mean, uh, basically progressives have captured uh, like at least four major social institutions, the media, the education system, um, the entertainment industry and um the government like all bureaucrats and actually i could you could add to that lawyers accountants um yeah. uh almost yeah, every, you know what they call this like, right actually this actually like like five okay now six is six is like all corporations who want to defend their um uh, their their uh, incumbent position through yeah. using regulatory power which sure. uh, basically anti-startup you know like so, Goldman yeah. or, social or, or, justice or, like, has a moat and it's and it's and it's amazing. I mean, like people uh, don't realize that um, you know the same person, say Obama, who's like uh, his rhetoric is all anti-capitalist, has a lot of corporatists backing him because 
they don't care if taxes go up. They're not making most of their money on income. They're making it on capital gains. And most of their capital is parked outside of the country anyways. And, yep. and like, uh, you know, this is the most, I don't know, like I, I'm not going to get into too, too big of a rant because I don't want to get derailed. Sure. The, sure, sure, um, sure. The, the thing it's I want to go. Just one, one want thing to just, to, to, just to go outline, ahead. just to outline uh, the term, just very simply, there's, there's a term that's explicitly outlined and used to describe what you're talking about, which is the long, long march through the institutions. I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase. But that's no, I'm not. There's a term because yeah. it, yeah. it is. It's like it, 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 you almost, you know, I, I'm very much against conspiracy theory as like a way of perceiving reality. But I think that there's, um, yeah, it's if you look, if you study the last the, the evolution of uh, political culture over the last century and a half, it's it's yeah. it's stunning. Yeah, man, it is. I mean, when you when you really start digging into it and you really start looking at all of the uh, the people who have kind of carried the torch of this ideology and philosophy, um, the patterns the patterns become very tempting to start applying conspiracy conspirat- ah, conspiratorial thoughts to. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to, it's hard to draw that line. I mean, because it's like history is not absent conspiracy <laughs> by any means. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so, you know, in the same way we use the caveman argument, um, I, I think, you know, I can imagine, I hear a feminist in my head saying, uh, uh, well, that's exactly right. We want to impose our values on the caveman. Um, but okay. Uh, uh, you know, I also hear that feminist saying we want our culture to evolve. We want consciousness to evolve. We want to be a more conscious society. Like this is about the evolution of consciousness and our values, blah, blah, blah. This is about the long march of history. Uh, this is about being on the right side of things. And, uh, and so you could do a reverse caveman experiment where it's like, uh, okay, what if you could go uh, six th- or 10,000 years into the future instead of 10,000 years into the past and pull someone from the future back? And let's just assume that, that future society is better in every way than ours. Um, uh, and you had to do the same exact re-education process where that person doesn't fit into our society and like literally would be put in jail because of their more evolved values. Um, uh, in a way, like what, um, what seems to be missing in, in, the, in the, the conversations we have politically. But I, I, think, I think you is, might fall prey to one of the rhetorical tactics there because they would you know, progressive, progressive effectively define uh, better morality by the directionality of time. So they would basically say that, you know, because this person is in the future, they must be better. Uh, they, they would likely be more progressive and therefore they would not necessarily be punished by our, you know, our dictums or they would, they would be so far beyond them that, you know, they would transcend them or some, something illogical like that. But I don't think they would win that argument though, because I don't either. <laughs> here's the point is that you can't, you can't proscribe the future. You can't say, we know the way this will play out over the next 10,000 years. Like, as long, unless you believe that morality has a final end truth, that it's like, and we've already achieved it. Like, we have a monopoly on truth. Truth is X. We know X. We're going to impose X. Uh, as long as you or, don't do or, or, or unless you believe in the dialectic, you know, Hegel's dialectic, right? Like, if you're a dialectic yeah. thinking, you, you do think that regardless of, you know, whatever these two, you know, uh, thesis and antithesis kind of, coming together, uh, they will produce a thin synthesis and that will be convergent upon the final point of truth, as you mentioned. That's right. So I, I actually tend to agree with Hegel, which is that there's, there's, as long as you're in time, there's an endless evolution of things. And the, the, the most important thing to do is pres- preserve the uh, ability of the individual to take a strange position that disagrees. Um, yeah. And and, and as, every well, time precisely you use, because of the yeah. fact, though, that, that, that it need not be convergent, that evolution need not be convergent on stable solutions, right? It can fall apart. It can destroy itself. It happens all the time throughout nature and the universe. And say, that again. That, what is, say, say that again. Like, it need not be a stable solution. So you know, the, the idea in evolutionary biology or in systems theory, if you look at the evolution of systems or in game theory, there's a notion of, of stable, evolutionary stable solutions, right? And so it's like just evolving and changing is not enough. You have to evolve and change in ways that satisfy the constraints of the system at many levels simultaneously such that it can continue to propagate itself through time. And that actually dramatically limits the number of possible solutions. And 
it also implies that you know not just any process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis will invariably lead towards stable solutions. There are very real possibilities that if things get pathological enough within the system itself, it will follow paths, evolutionary paths that lead to uh, you know, uh, uh, existential terminus, right? Uh, extinction. Um, and this is also, this is related to things like the great filter theory, right? Which is related to, um, you know, the paradoxes around why don't we see more life in the universe? Well, it's possible that, what? Go ahead, finish the thought. Well, it's possible that there are these elements within us, within life itself, where there are tendencies along the evolutionary path to go in certain directions that fundamentally have no ability to survive, right? And you might not know that you're going down one of those paths until it's too late. And it may look like you're making progress locally when globally you've already made the decision in your past that has condemned you to extinction. And it's, it's almost impossible to know that, but yeah. it doesn't preclude its reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is why I think uh, crucifixion is important. <laughs> um, okay. So. Um, I decided to commit social suicide on Sunday and I've decided to do it previous times and I've, uh, mm. and somehow I'm not dead yet. Um, yeah. but, I, saw that. Uh, I was like, wow, like, <laughs> this is like, this is a hell of a litany of, of posts here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, it's, it's not even, it's not even because I believe I'm right. Um, I don't know if I'm right or not. Um, I'll even assume that I'm wrong. Um, it's that somehow I feel that, um, certain, uh, by being strange people, even when they commit, when strange people who commit social suicide or like say Jesus getting crucified, um, uh, let's just assume Jesus was wrong. Um, uh, he created a clearing, right? He created, and this is a Heideggerian term, you know, he created the, the, uh, he died, but um, by dying in such a way, created the, uh, the me too possibility. <laughs> um, where, uh, you know, other people can say, you know, at least there's one example of somebody else who, who had this point of view. And, um, and so, uh, I think sanity, sanity is very much a uh, social, uh, cord. Um, it's, yeah. it's very much held in a stasis. And so, uh, I, I increasingly feel insane. Um, and, and increasingly don't know if it's me talking or like why I'm taking positions. All I know is that, um, I just like literally can't keep absorbing the messaging. Like right across the street, there is a sign that says women's rights are human rights. Science and reason matter. What the fuck does that mean? Like, oh, I, I agree. I agree with both statements on the surface. Like women's rights are human rights. I agree. Science and reason matter. I agree. But like, what does that mean? And, and so like, I get enough, I almost feel like I'm like some sort of like weird, like, um, uh, like, ex, like Petri dish where like all this yeah. shit gets put in and then I like explode. And then it's like, the explosion is whatever you read. And I don't even know if I agree yeah. with it, but it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a reaction to this. And, um, and the, uh, the, the I, I guess, like, talk about political uh, correctness and reduction. Like, what does, uh, you know, there's this tendency that there's only one or two possible positions as opposed to infinite ones. And so, like, what, I, like, what I'm willing to do in, on almost evolutionary, social evolutionary plane is, like, uh, go uh, do a kamikaze move as long as, sure. it, as long as it creates a clearing for somebody else to go through. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think there, there's two things to say about that that are related and hopefully the first will lead to a better understanding of the second. So the first is that it also is very closely tied into some of the way that Peterson talks about this stuff, which is, you know, you're not just playing one game, you're playing a series of games over a long period of time. And to the extent that you kill yourself in one game, to the extent that you sacrifice yourself in one game, you're unable to play many others. Now, then that introduces the notion that there's a tension between, uh, there's a tension of choice between where and when to sacrifice yourself to, to gain the most benefit over time or to maximize the idea to create that clearing of which you speak, right? And it's like, how is it necessarily obvious that it's on Facebook on Sunday or is, you know, is kind of like, you know, picking and choosing your battles 
uh, something that needs to be done. I, I don't know. And to some extent, it may just be psychological venting and needing to actually get it off your chest to maintain sanity, which I completely empathize with because I feel very similarly these days. Um, now, this, the second part of that is, are you familiar? You know, you, you, you play with swords. I've seen, I've seen, I seen some people. Are you familiar with the idea of uh, annealing? The annealing no. process? No. So annealing is actually, it's a, it's a way of, it's a metallurgical term that basically applies to the application of heat to metal and then allowing that metal to cool. And, you know, what happens over time is, you know, the, the crystalline structure of the metal, let's say it begins like this, you heat it up, you introduce more uh, movement into the system, more freedom into the system. And then you cool it down and it's, it comes and basically becomes a little bit more aligned with itself and with other pieces, right? And then you do that, you know, many times and it comes together into a system that is actually much more closely aligned, stronger, but also more flexible. So a system that overall, its overall properties, you know, with this consistent application of disruption and stabilization, disruption and stabilization over time becomes more, uh, it basically gets more of the properties, more of all the properties that you'd want in the system, right? You want it to be malleable. You want it to be hard. You want it to be flexible when you need to be flexible, right? you, Like all the things that you would want of this metal, you can get through this system of annealing. And, you know, to actually do learning in computer simulations or you know, artificial intelligence, certain types of artificial intelligence or machine learning processes, there's something called simulated annealing, which is similar, which is like, you know, they use a hill climbing. And it's like, oh, you're trying to like climb the, you know, climb the hills of optimal solutions. But then you, know, you don't wanna get stuck at one hill if there might be a better, you know, higher mountain peak over here. So you shock the system, introduce some randomness into it, you know, a few roll down the hill and have to find their what way. Is that called? I love that. I think about that all the time. Well, so that's simulated annealing um, and it's hill climbing. That's a hill climbing algorithm. So huh. it's, it, it's one way that people who simulate social scientists who simulate social phenomenon and evolution via computer programs um, try to understand the, you know, try to understand the game theory of uh, how, well, there's many ways you can apply it. You can apply it at the genetic level. You can apply it at the, the game theoretic social yeah. level. But it, on the social level, you need an individual who's willing to be the explosion. Yes, precisely. The system. Yeah, and like that's actually in, you know, in mythological terms, that's the hero, right? Like the hero is, is he or she who goes and gets new information and brings that back to the system. And the system will try to kill the hero most times, yeah. right? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, but the interesting thing is most the heroes will tell the hero that the hero is evil, even yeah. if the hero well, is good. And that's but, but most would be, crazy. Well, yes, but most would be heroes should probably be killed because most would be heroes might be bringing the wrong information back. And the wrong information might actually be the information that destroys the society. Right. So it's like if you look at it as the hill climbing art, you know, the hill climbing metaphor, the society clusters at the top of the highest known mountaintop. Right. And it doesn't make sense to send everybody as an explorer because if you do that, the probability of death while exploring is very high. The probability of finding nothing or finding the wrong thing is very high. Um, so you have a certain type of people that who have evolved with personality characteristics. This is like the high and openness traits, you know, people who are just constantly getting information, but then they bring it back to the, the society. And the society, those who are, you know, tend to stay on the local maxima are also those who actually tend to have the personality characteristics of conservatives who like to draw boundaries around their society and like to say, okay, I know you think that you brought back this useful thing, but you need to prove that and you need to show us. And even if you show us and prove it, we'll still probably try to kill you and try, probably try to burn you. And only then, if you can either evade that or somehow your message is so contagious that even if we kill you, if you become a martyr and the idea continues and persists past your life, only then, and maybe, maybe it's actually completely necessary. Maybe the people have to be killed such that the society must decide whether or not the idea was worth it. Um, but only then can you actually incorporate that knowledge into the, the body. Like imagine if the knowledge is like, oh, hey, listen, there's a flood coming and you need to move off this mountaintop. Like very few people are gonna be like, hey, that sounds like a great idea to pick up, leave and do all this hard shit, risk death to find this other place based on the, you know, the ravings of this madman, most people aren't gonna agree to that. And 
my, my kind of tendency, you know, my, my unfortunate analysis uh, for unfortunate and fortunate of humanity is that we have a tendency to wait until we start seeing the actual water rising to be like, Oh, wasn't that person talking about rising water? Uh. <laughs> so, uh, I love that. Um, and, um, I, uh, I appreciate the Hayekian and, and Burkean conservative position, which is really sophisticated because mm -hmm. it says it recognizes there's like a deep intelligence in the way things are because mm -hmm. they are that way because they evolved to be that way. Um, yeah. and which that's seems why, like, a, like a tautology at the surface level, but it's, it's not. It's not. Um, that's why Lincoln's, you know, God must love normal people because he made so many of them. Um, you know, this is why suburbia exists and it's just like fucking like everyone likes the same thing. Like, but if you're, if, but, but I think it's also important to recognize you, I think actually I am, I am, uh, I believe all that. Um, uh, I actually assume that I'm wrong, uh, and that society is right. And that exactly the way things are is the best possible way. Cause I actually think that, um, uh, and yet I, I think that my knowing that my function in society is to question society because I am that person who like yeah. sees, sees other possibilities. Um, because it's only the best possible uh, way for right now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and so if I take 10 positions and you told me that every, out of every 10 positions I take, nine of them are wrong and dangerous. And one of them is profoundly right. And, or even, even if it's a smaller percentage, like, if, if out of every hundred things I ever say, only one of them is profoundly right, um, I'm going to still keep talking because um, uh, unlike driving down the uh, Highway 5, like where the chances of actual death are actually really high, um, uh, the chances of physical death uh, through free, free speech are very low. And so you should take as many risks as you can. Um, uh, agree or disagree? Uh, in a bounded sense, I agree. <laughs> What's the bound? I, so I mean, I, I think I think the bound is is also, you know, there's an interesting boundary between what you're talking about because I would say that like, you know, people who are on the other side of this divide, the social justice divide, so to speak, just speaking of that one issue, um, you know, they're also the explorers, right? They just think that nine out of their ten. Nine, uh, nine out of 10 of their ideas are good ideas. So I think it's very, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's impinged, it's, it's, yeah, the burden of proof in terms of the, the quality of your ideas lies with the person bringing back the new ideas. And one should retain a certain level of humility with respect to the probability that they'll be incorrect. And, and to the extent that it's, unlikely that an idea you have in your head may lead to greater stabilization than destabilization, there is some responsibility that lies upon the explorer to, to not speak those words. Right. But to what extent should we hedge, you know, like, because the, the explorer is never hundred percent fully sure. And so no. I, but I think you, you, you know, you have to stick the landing. You have to say there's a flood coming, even if it's only 10% true because, um, uh, -huh. uh yeah. You know, yeah. otherwise you're just this like sort of pathetic weakling who's well, like, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm probably wrong. There might be blah, 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 might, might, maybe in some certain situations, um, uh, there's some possibility that which, blah, 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 I, you know, like, say, say what you want to fucking say, you know? Um, that's, and that's the rationale, to, right? Like, this, this, this interesting part is because it's like what you're saying is that even if each individual explorer may only be right one one hundredth of the time, each individual explorer has to believe that what they're saying is 100% correct. I don't think they have to, I mean, I don't believe it. Um, but I, I do know that I have to say it. Um, and, and because okay. the thing is, I don't think I'm going up against something weak. I think I'm going up against something profoundly strong. Like the, the conservative forces within society are immense. I mean, for example, all the social justice warriors and feminists and progressives are, are the new conservatives. Uh, so like you have yeah. basically they don't, they don't realize that yet they would never they would never agree to that terminology but from a from a pattern of behavior perspective it's certainly true yeah i mean they've captured all the institutions so you have the actual conservatives and the the, the anti-conservatives the progressive they're all conservative so um you know even if i have a only a 10 percent level of conviction uh i'm gonna like shout it from the rooftops because it's just like 
um, you know, uh, maybe if, if, if the system changes, then, then the system had the intelligence to see something I, I didn't know. Um, the system happened to agree with me. Wow, what an interesting surprise. Um, it's almost like a, a trader in the market. You know, you're taking a position. The market is so much bigger than you. You're not actually worried about manipulating the market. Um, yeah. but, uh, but you're always surprised when it agrees with you. So back, you know, along those lines and back to your point of like, where's the line? I think the degree to which a person's line is justifiable is distinctly related to, you know, how well that, you know, how, how good of a job that person has done is actually trying to uh, invalidate their quote unquote null hypothesis, right? Like to what extent have you actually tried to disprove yourself? To what extent have you really tried to understand whether you could be incorrect and yet still keep coming back to what you perceive to be this new idea or truth? And I think that there are demonstrable ways of, of actually starting to, to kind of evaluate the quality of different people's new ideas based on the extent to which they fail to take into account that which we already know, right? And that which we understand about history. But yeah. the, the thing about that is that then that's the, that's the postmodernist, um, that's where the postmodernist technique comes in because it says, oh, well, you want me to prove based on historical uh, data or knowledge that I actually have worthwhile ideas? Well, fuck you. All of your past analysis is interpretive and uh, completely subjective and has no objective footing in the world and therefore gives you absolutely no leverage to justify the existence of whatever systems are uh, currently, uh, you know, currently expressing their uh, ability to maintain social structure, right? Because it's yeah, all- Yeah, because white, white, white men wrote history. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. The, uh, um, so I, I used to think that I needed to take that responsibility entirely on myself. I needed to do all the homework. I needed to play both sides of the chess game. I needed to both have the argument, have the counter argument to my own argument, have the counter counter argument and just play it all by myself. And until I was completely clear that I was right, I shouldn't say anything. And I would, in my writing itself, it'd be so edited, it'd be so like uh, overwrought. Um, whereas now that I know I'm going up against something that's immensely powerful, um, I let, I let, I let the universe come back with the dialectic and I, I'm literally learning by arguing. Um, and because like, I don't need to know, uh, where I'm wrong because the universe will tell me. Um, and so I'll let, I'll let the dialectic educate as long as I just keep playing the counter. Um, I mean, perhaps, so, perhaps you're actually in that more destabilizing and divergent phase of your own evolution and then you'll basically converge again and maybe you'll, you know, I mean, that, that's how I can't, I can't speak at all for your life and your path, well, but yeah, but I guess the question is for you, like to what, uh, cause I know that in your mind, this is happening where it's like society is taking points of view and your mind is generating the counter. Um, not many people are actually capable of doing that. Um, and, and recognizing the validity of the counter. Do you mm -hmm. see it as a kind of moral responsibility of yours to take counter positions for every position that society takes? Um, Perhaps not for all, but for many. I mean, I've, I've, you know, many people have labeled me a contrarian throughout my life. I tend to just consider myself a realist, um, a, pragma a pragmatist, a realist, someone who wants to understand, like given my extremely limited capacity for understanding as a human being, um, and my desire to live a good life, to keep on living my life without meeting an untimely end, uh, and to help humanity manifest its potential over time in ways that uh, continuously create more value and relatively less suffering. Uh, to the extent that I can understand the world and further that goal, um, I try to do so. And to the extent that I see society falling into patterns of behavior and expressing certain views that, based on everything I know, not only seem to be going in the wrong direction, but seem to be doing so without displaying in any sense that they've really understood the issue, then it's definitely my responsibility. Like if, if, if people are saying things that are destructive and it's very clear that they are speaking from a place where they lack knowledge or lack understanding or lack empathy or lack uh, frame of reference from which to speak, then, you know, 100%, I have a moral imperative to, to play the contrarian there. Um, and to the extent that, they but, I mean, disagree. that's happening all the time. That's literally happening all the time. 
Yeah, yeah. And well, and so then, so, and therefore, then the question, I guess, maybe becomes how much of your time do you spend doing this? And, yeah, exactly. And so, to that extent, you know. And on how many fronts are you willing to fight? Because you could be fighting on all the fronts. And yeah. yeah. And once and, again, and, and, and I. By I the way, they're, they're moving, the enemy is, the virus is mutating so fast. <laughs> You know, you, it's like very hard to keep up. And so the quality of your argument needs to almost descend to the quality of their argument in order to move as fast as them. Well, perhaps. And so that's what I'm trying to experiment with. Because it's like, to some extent, there is a, you know, to some extent, you can try to put your nose to the, to the page and, and, you know, operate at that high frequency and engage with every, you know, every single word at, at one inch. But, you know... And, and you have to do that to some extent to, to understand the reality on the ground, right? So I kind of think it's like this level of, at least in my life, it seems to be, I engage for a while and then I withdraw and try to survey and understand where I might be able to go and you know, reposition myself to therefore kind of go back down to the ground level and engage again, as opposed to, because like if you're on the ground level at all times, you know, it, it's very, I feel like it's very easy to have like drift, right? Like you get kind of swept up in, whatever the, the conceptual or philosophical or zeitgeist of the day is. So it's like, you know, if I watch, you know, YouTube videos of Ben Shapiro every day, um, you know, I get caught up in his conceptual drift. And, you know, that might be okay if it's intentional, if you're surfing a wave to understand what it's like to surf the wave. But if the surfing of the wave becomes so normal that you forget you're surfing and it's just your life, then, you are now sacrificing your autonomy to that trend, to that force. And, you know, to the extent that I can, I try to sample those forces, but not become subject to them. And, and I think that doing so allows me to choose where to exert my energy with maintained sanity to the extent I can, and perhaps hopefully greater impact. I don't know. Yeah. So, I, I visualize what you were talking about as a cavalry charge. So you, you go in, you just, sh you, you, you try to see the enemy line, see where they're weak and you like come in and you just crush, crush, crush. And then like, okay, they reposition around you. You're starting to get a bunch of spears in your face. You pull out uh, and you like go run away and you like disappear and then you like observe. And then like, you know, just- when well, that's, the, least that's, that's the OODA loop. If, if, if you want military metaphors, it's the, uh, the OODA loop, right? Yeah, uh, which is observe or orient, uh, what, what is it? It was like observe, orient, something, and then act. What is the... Yeah, there? it's like constantly, yeah. re it's exactly right. It is that. Um, it's, uh, yeah. what is it? Observe, orient, decide, and act. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I've had your pattern as well, which is like, uh, say something, go out, say something, go out. Um, and then... Uh, I've realized that actually my, my learning cycle will be rapidly sped up if I'm always in the fray. Um, because um, there's a certain amount, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, as much as retreating to my temple and reading books is nice, I've spent most of my life doing that. Um, and, uh, and I think that as much as I would like the, it to be rationalized by like, oh, you know, this is how I like, go get Promethean fire from the gods and I bring it back. Uh, I think the most likely explanation for my uh, hesitation to engage is, is lack of courage um, and, uh, and a desire to be right um, or, or a desire to at least be, per, you know, like be perceived. Or at as least, like, a, or at least a fear of being wrong. <laughs> a fear, fear of being perceived as idiotic. I would rather be like yeah. perceived as wrong, but sophisticated. Um, uh, and, um, and so uh, I try to hedge against that. So, you know, how do you examine, and, and I'd like to spend the, the, the last 15 minutes basically, um, getting to, uh, getting, going back to the original like point of fascination for me, which is like, how do you respond to the overwhelming complexity of reality? Uh, it's just like daunting complexity of everything. Um, you as a person are like one of the most complexity sensitive people I know. So you are constantly flirting with confusion and turning it into clarity. Um, and so a lot of this, this final question is around, yeah, okay, if you're the cavalry charge where you're, coming, you're, you're got, coming to clarity, you're bringing your clarity in, you're attacking with clarity, you end up in a confusion state again, you pull out and you regain clarity before you come back in. Like, how do you, 
talk about that. How do you how do you do that? So yeah, I mean, I think I think requires to some extent that requires there's there's sort of a. I look at my learning process as sort of like a agglomerative or an accretion process to some extent, right? And I'm simultaneously getting new artifacts that enter my world that I have to find, either decide whether they're relevant or irrelevant. And, you know, if they're relevant, I have to understand where they fit into my current picture of reality, right? It, you know, you can kind of think of your current map of what relevant information is as um, almost like one's own, you know, conceptual or philosophical scrap board, right? But that being said, the scrap board is not just one dimensional. It's many dimensions and it's many levels of resolution. And so I'm simultaneously trying to update my map of reality. So what are the physical truths we know about the world and the systems and the way that they interact at each scale of each physical scale, right? Like everything from like quantum physics up through, you know, the, the layer at which we interact, uh, the human layer, um, how that layer interacts with layers beneath and above it. And then the macro truths outside of it. And then not only like, what are the unique, interesting physical realities about all that, but what are the connections across all of those scales? What are the, what are the scale invariant patterns that persist across almost every level of reality that we understand? And to the extent that there are patterns that conform to certain truths across all of those scales of reality, in the world of complexity, one would expect to be able to use those truths to predict things at our level of reality, right? And so the that, you know, I don't just study all of these other layers because I'm interested in the layers. There has to be a purpose. And the purpose is to the extent that I can understand what these truths of all these scales are, I can apply those to human behavior. I can understand maybe slightly better than others how uh, you know, what will happen tomorrow based on the information that's coming in today? Uh, but then that becomes the question of, well, what relevant, what information today is relevant? Um, and so that's a whole nother process, which is trying to effectively treat your senses as something that you should probably trust less than your intuitive senses would tell you, right? You have to, to some extent say, you know, what would I believe if the world was constantly trying to lie to me, Right. Um, what, what can I actually, what can I actually, what information can I take in given what I know about the reality and the incentives of those people giving me the information? Um, uh, you know, what is, what is worth actually adding to that model? And that starts tying the objective model into the subjective model. And the subjective model is something that I'm less familiar with, but I've been spending a lot of time over the past, well, I spent, I've spent a decent amount of time over my life under trying to understand the subjective model, but intensely for the past two years or so, which is the study of philosophy, the study of religion, the study of mythology, the study of psychology. Uh, you know, I studied psychology, that was my major, evolutionary psychology and, you know, behavioral economics. So it's like, I'm not unfamiliar with it, but I've been dramatic, you know, dramatically ramping up the extent to which I'm giving credit to all other forms of information um, historically that have spoken to the subjective. So you know, what does the mythological reality say? What does the religious reality say? Um, you know, what, are, what, is, what patterns can be drawn from the progression of philosophical thought over time? And so, you know, that's for me, it's like, you know, the intersection of that objective and subjective, you know, that is the filtering mechanism by which I try to understand what is actually relevant um, in the day to day, what information is actually relevant to take in and at what time scale that can actually be useful. So that's another question. So, okay. So now let's say that you have this whole model, you have all this information of subjective objective, you're still left with the question of how does you even convert that knowledge into action and, you know, action today, action tomorrow, action next week. And that's an interesting question as well, which is to what extent will your actions persist in their effects or wash out over time? What kind of impact will you actually have? And you know, that's another thing where complexity and chaos theory has a lot to say in terms of you know, these sensitive dependence on initial conditions, which is like, it's ironic because you can actually have a lot of impact on the evolution of a system if you impart that impact at the right place in time and you impart the right impact. But to know that and to know how to actually do so is, a maddeningly difficult question, 
which kind of speaks to your strategy of just do it everywhere all the time. Fight the it's battle. The opposite, it's the opposite of Wu Wei. It's a Wei Wu. It's doing, instead of doing by not doing, it's not doing by doing. Do all the things and it's probably going to be ineffective. Ineffective yeah. quite a strategy. So, and that's the thing is it's like, do you spread yourself infinitely thin and hope that the thin impact on, you know, that, that thin manifold overlaps with the place in time and space where the impact will carry itself forward through time? Or do you actually try to use, you know, the question fundamentally boils down to, to what extent can the human mind actually take in this complexity and direct it towards meaningful action in a way that has any insight with respect to its bearing on the way that reality unfolds? And, you know, I think I, I haven't really, I, my answer to that depends on the day you ask still, you know? And in my emotional state and what I'm seeing in the world around me, I wish there was an objective answer there, but I don't know if there is or can be, which is why, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I just try to do it to the best of my ability. I try to take the information in. I try to focus my action towards what I can without going insane every day, which is becoming increasingly difficult. The more the world becomes polarized and pulls us all in different directions. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think to that, that also speaks to the idea that right now my focus is in presenting a lot of this information in ways that depolarizes, in ways that finds whatever overlapping territory still remains and plants a stake in that ground and tries to create a gravitational attraction there, right? How do you pull people back to the shared overlapping territory? Because it's only on the shared overlapping ter territory where the complexity can be meaningfully explored. And this goes back to the polarization loop earlier. It's like the further you get out into the edges of polarization, the less you can really examine the meaningful complexity of reality. And I would argue the less you can therefore take actions that are both wise and courageous. What would you say to someone like me who sees the same things that you see and goes decides that hyperpolarization is the solution because hyperpolarization becomes so ridiculous. It's like throwing a stone at a stained glass window and it's just causing just things to shatter because when they shatter, then they can rearrange. Well, I mean, there's a cost in shattering things to some extent. They, you know, there's some probability that they may remain shattered and there's some probability that we may use the pieces to build something better. Um, I would say that given the degree to which we overlap, we can have conversations like this and we can experiment with uh, diametrically opposed strategies and, and kind of use yeah. that. You know, I think, so actually the, the article I mentioned I'm about to publish is called the, Ta uh, the, the Tao of Netflix culture, which actually has a lot to do with, you know, the Wu Wei to some extent, the path and, uh, you know, the, the duality of the yin yang and, um, mapping that onto the ideas of freedom and responsibility. And actually one of the sections is called intention, intention, right? Intention, like as our, our intentions, intention, as in like under, you know, a line under tension. And um, to the extent that we pursue those two diametrically opposed strategies, yet are still connected to one another by the dialogue we're having here, uh, we are actually embodying that idea of intention, intention. And we are, I think, therefore exploring the universe in a way that can be productive and can actually result in new knowledge and, and hopefully uh, increasingly uh, better patterns of survival and, and growth. I need to go in two minutes. Um, so thank you so much. We've had a long conversation, longer than I, longer than I, uh, I was planning for. And I'm, uh, I even pushed off my one o'clock call. Um, so well, thank you. Because I we, we spent, no, I mean, you didn't need to know. We spent, um, I think we spent um, uh, way more than 90 minutes. We spent like um, uh, two more hours. than 100. Yeah, two hours. Two, more than two hours, like two hours and 15 minutes. Um, holy shit. And it was so fast. It like, <laughs> we covered a lot of territory. Um, and we dealt with a lot of complexity. And I think uh, I'm, I'm, right, I'm leaving the conversation both more confused and more clear on just about everything, which is exactly what I want. Um, and I think it, it, the conversation embodied a response to confusion, um, which is like playing, playing, playing with all these concepts and inverting them and spinning them around. Um, uh, I, um, I want to just close by telling you like the effect it had on, a final effect it had on me, which is, um, 
uh, bringing me to clarity on this, which is that um, we live in an age of veiled threat where it's not actually clear who's the enemy or what's the problem. And so you're seeing this like groping for an enemy and you're groping, like reaching, grasping for an enemy, grasping for something to like be angry at and to, a problem to solve. Uh, because mm -hmm. actually we're living in an age in which all problems are being solved uh, so quickly. Um, and that's another thing uh, we should talk about another day, another day. Yeah. And so, uh, in a Heideggerian sense, we're in a concealed age as opposed to a revealed age. Whereas you look at a movie like Dunkirk and it's like very clear. It was a very revealed mm -hmm. time where it's like good, evil sides, like conflict, very, very clear what to do. And we're also living in an age in which, um, there's a very low cost to, to the, the primary domain of warfare, which is speech. Um, you know, people don't die when you speak, not normally, um, and at least not right now. So, um, so I'm becoming, as a Heideggerian Taoist, I'm becoming clear that my way is, my way is Wei Wu, um, uh, because there's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to die, you know, die in the realm of speech nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100 in order to shock the system out of the hilltops. Um, and um, well, I mean, you're so dying conceptually, you though, not physically. Dying conceptually. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's because it's low risk. And so, what, yes. what I'm trying to do is like trying to force the system out of concealment. Show me the enemy. Show me the enemy. Where are you, enemy? I'm looking for you. Are you there? Are you there? Shock, shock, shock. Reveal yourself. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, to the, to the extent that I've helped you along your path, uh, I, I am. Uh, I, I'm willing to do so whenever you'd like to do so. And I'm also yeah. very much grateful for the opportunity to talk. I know your time is, yeah. uh, time is meaningful as well. You too. Time, your time is meaningful too. Do you have a final comment like that of like what, um, what, what was in, in the sense that this conversation was an essaying forth into territory, uh, what mm -hmm. was revealed to you um, through the conversation? And then I'll end it. We'll end it. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say from my perspective, and this is something we could perhaps unfold at another time, but I'm exploring and thinking a lot about this idea of the fractal nature of reality, the fractal nature of suffering to the extent that, you know, in, in a fractal pattern, when you look at it from one level, you see that these, there's these margins, right? And, and the margins ostensibly take up a very small percentage of what you're seeing. But then when you get into those margins, when you start actually exploring them, you, you kind of start actually understanding not only the richness of those patterns, but also their infinite depth and the ability to continuously recalibrate your understanding of which patterns are the most relevant patterns uh, which, you know, to which one should pay attention, right? And that the infinite complexity of that fractal pattern means that without people with whom you can actually calibrate yourself meaningfully while exploring that infinitude, you will lose yourself. And you know, if we each lose ourselves in that way, if we lose the ability to cohere, and if we, we, all, if we all trend offwards in our own unique path of exploration in that fractal, without being able to connect, without being able to remain connected as, a, as an integral organism, as a collective organism, you know, we'll, I think we stand a far, you know, we stand, we don't stand a very good job. Uh, we don't stand a very good chance of actually continuing to be able to even explore the pattern itself. And I, I find the pattern to be very beautiful. I very, you know, I very much enjoy exploring the pattern continuously. And I think to the extent that I'm able to find people like you and we're able to have conversations like this, we are in fact allowing humanity to continue exploring this pattern. And hopefully, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, bringing us back to some extent from the existential brink. Yeah, it creates a lot, it's sanity creating. Thank you for the sanity creating conversation. <laughs> Matthew Sun. Thank you, Francis.